What's up, glitches? In today's video, we're gonna start with an ancient Egyptian audio recording, which I don't even know exactly what that is, but it sounds very intriguing. I love ancient Egypt. And then we're gonna read nine more unexplainable experiences sent in by fans. So sit back, grab a snack, and let's get weird. Hi, Dematrix. Hi. Before I relate this anecdote, I have to thank you for being you. Your energy is beautiful. And in the midst of the hardest year of my life, your content has been a much needed boost. Oh my God, thank you so much. So in 2006, my dad and I spent a month traveling through Egypt. My dad's a humble, semi-retired Egyptologist, and I, then a grad student in literature, accompanied him in part because I'd studied Arabic and had some fluency. I was there also to journal for him and had a brand new Canon camera. At the time we visited the Valley of the Kings in Luxor, only one person at a time was allowed to step into the room where Tutankhamun, Tutankhamun? I can't say that. King Tut, in parentheses, we're going to just say King Tut, had been entombed. My dad paid for me to go in. He had worked in the Valley of the Nobles and had seen it all before. At most tourist sites, no cameras were permitted, and this site was no exception, but there was exactly no one else in the tomb, so I attempted to sneak a photo. As you'll see in the attached video, I didn't capture much of an image. It's a six-second video in which I turned the camera in my hand and recorded a male voice. I hadn't heard anything for the two minutes I stood there, but it sounds as though the speaker was right next to me and speaking a language I have yet to identify. It's not Arabic. I had other supernatural experiences in my travels through Egypt, but this was the most extraordinary. We have to look at this video. All right, here we go. What was that? It does. It sounds like the person is right next to them whispering in some weird language. Wait, let's listen again. I really wish that they were able to identify the language and translate what is being said, because like, what is being said? That is so weird. What do you guys think about this? This one is called Demon in the Doorway? Question mark? Hi, Indy Matrix. Hi. Love your videos and have been following you for a while now. This story occurred when I was around 9 to 10 years old and my one sibling older sister was 12 to 13. One night, my sister had gone to a birthday party sleepover where her and her friends decided to play with the Ouija board. Uh, always ends up bad in these stories. Whatever they had come in contact with told my sister it was her guardian angel. Nope. All she had to do to know they were around all the time was to tell them that they were allowed to come home with her. I don't know what she was thinking or how she could have believed that. Needless to say, she invited it home. Why? Oh, my God. Do you guys notice my cat's fighting in the background, by the way? <laughs> we shouldn't be playing with Ouija boards in the first place. But if we're going to play with a Ouija board, do not invite something home home. Almost right away, our parents and both of us kids started hearing odd things around the house like someone was walking in another room. The whole house had carpet, so the footsteps were muffled. No one paid it much attention because we had a couple of dogs and all of us thought it was one of them moving around. It never was the dogs. We lived in a rambler style home and at the end of the hallway where it came to a T and split to go towards the bedrooms, my sister and I would see shadows moving out of the corner of our eyes, peeking around a corner. Little things started moving in my sister's bedroom too, like tag Bags hanging off of things would start flipping back and forth, almost as though the string was being spun around someone's thumb and index finger. We got a label check-in demon. This went on for some months and our parents never believed us, chalked it up to kids' imaginations. Parents never believe. Either A, parents never believe, or B, parents do believe, but they don't want to scare the kids, so they just... Until one night... I used to sleep with my bed across from the bedroom door and flush with the wall. My door would always be open. Across the hall was my sister's room and she too always slept with her door open. This night would change all of that and begin my fear of the dark and unknown. I don't know what time it was. I was nine to 10 years old and this was 30 years ago. All I knew is that I woke up out of a sound sleep startled by who knows what. As soon as I opened my eyes and looked across the hallway into my sister's room, in her doorway was a pitch black hooded figure with glowing green eyes staring at me. I couldn't make out anything other than the fact that the space where the face should have been was even darker. The only features were the cloaked form and the glowing eyes. I started screaming. I felt like I was screaming for 10 minutes when it was probably more like five seconds. Why was no one hearing me scream? Why weren't our parents flying down the hall to check and see what's happening? Suddenly, behind the figure, I saw my sister getting out of her bed and moving quite slowly to her doorway. 
The figure finally looked away from me and at my sister. As soon as this happened, she had turned on her light switch and the figure disappeared. I came out of my hysterics and I asked her why she hadn't come help me sooner. She had no idea what I was talking about. She had only woken up to use the bathroom. She never heard my screams. Neither did our parents. Luckily, after this incident, our parents believed us and had someone come to the house for a blessing or I don't know, as I was so young. All I know is that the person made it go away and we never had issues with the cloaked figure again. Thank you so much for reading my story. I wonder why A, no one heard your screams and B, why you were able to see this figure and your sister was not when she was like literally walking towards the doorway. Whatever that was, I am so glad that someone came over, blessed the house and you guys are good. No wonder why you're scared of the dark. Now I'm scared of the dark and this didn't even happen to me. Okay, I'm not okay with this one, obviously. It's not a doll exactly, but it is a toy. It's called Haunted Fisher Price Telephone Toy Terrorized Me. I feel like this is not the first time I've heard a story about that telephone toy. I also used to have dreams, not about this telephone toy, but I used to have repeating recurring nightmares of this little like toy piano that I had, and it would be literally chasing me around and trying to get me. And I would always go to my mom and be like, pick me up, pick me up. And she would never pick me up. She was always like, oh, you're fine. Everything's fine. I'm hoping that this is also just a dream, but I don't think it is. I think it's more than that. So let's see. Hi, Auntie. Hi. Your page is my favorite. Oh, thank you. Legit instead of Netflix, I go on your page. Love your content. Love your personality. You absolutely rock. You guys are so sweet to me. Thank you so much for your compliments. I have a few crazy stories, but definitely one stands out as it's the one that always freaked me out. It occurred during my youth for years, starting when I was eight to my early teens. Here goes my story that still haunts me to this day. To give some context to the story, I was born in a very conservative Christian home. My dad was a police officer and I was the oldest of six kids. We lived a sheltered life heavily built on religion. We were Christian reformed. We went to church twice every Sunday, catechism class on Tuesdays, and went to a private Christian school. We dressed a certain way and weren't allowed to do things normal kids did. We weren't even allowed to watch Disney films as my dad said it's evil and brainwashing filled with demotic subliminal messages. Being so heavy into the church, we knew heaven and hell existed. We knew Satan was real. We didn't ever nor would ever participate in anything like Ouija boards. Although I remember growing up as kids, weird stuff always happening in our house, especially during times of stress or when we prayed. My dad said that if we ever saw anything paranormal or demonic to hold our Bible and say, in Jesus' name, leave. So when events like cupboards opening and closing or one day all of our flip-flops and shoes started flying all over the room, we didn't think much of it, but we would say the infamous line, in Jesus' name, leave, and it would stop. How did we not think anything of flip-flops flying all over the room? I would think a lot about that. (laughs) All of my siblings and I have experienced paranormal stories and we wouldn't even get freaked out by it because my parents made it seem so normal. We pray, it stops. All six of us would regularly play the chair game where we would chant a phrase, each one of us holding two fingers underneath the chair with one of us sitting on it and the chair with one of us siblings would rise on its own. So like light as a feather, stiff as a board, except with a chair. I've never played that. Anytime my parents caught us playing it, we would get in massive shit, saying it was demonic and to stop immediately. We also regularly saw each other's doppelgangers, but they would never speak in your home. How are the religious parents not having a priest come here and bless this entire house? Because clearly you saying in Jesus name leave is working temporarily, but we need a more permanent fix here, it seems like. One story stands out by far the most. Because thinking back now, how terrifying, but I wasn't afraid at the time, I found it cool. We had this toy telephone. Remember those ones that had the eyes? It was a phone and it had certain phrases. I know exactly the phone we're talking about. It's that Fisher Price telephone. We're gonna put up a picture of it so you guys can visualize. The thing itself is creepy. Look at those eyes. Like it's just the eyes and the smile. Nope. So now that we know what the phone looks like, let's continue. We had this toy telephone. Remember the ones that had the eyes? It was a phone and it had certain phrases. However, our phone actually talked to us, me in particular. When my sisters and I would play with it and pick up the phone receiver, we would talk to a man that told us his name was H, just H. Sometimes he would be there, other times he wasn't. But when he would talk, he would know our names. He would know details of our day. Throughout the years, I would go to the phone always hoping he would be available to talk because sometimes it wouldn't work and I would hate that. But often he was there. I have so many chills. Luna's scared too. It was always very muffled and he whispered. 
He told us he lives in a bad place and he wishes he could get out. I asked how I could meet him one day. I wanted to help him. He always made us feel guilty and bad for like going to school or when we wouldn't come and check on him. One day in particular, he said, soon we will meet in person. I told my parents about it, but they didn't believe me. My dad said to quit the bull and stop scaring my brothers and sisters. I said, Dad, he's really there. Look, I picked up the receiver of the phone and it wouldn't work. My dad said enough and took the phone away. However, the next morning when I went downstairs to eat, there was the phone with all the other kids' toys. So I picked it up and I said, if you're there, say hello. Right away, his muffled voice said, Laura, my name. This time, the phone's eyes were fluttering, and for some reason, the phone was hot. I told H I was sorry that my dad was mad I was talking to him. In response, he said, we won't be able to talk anymore. Your dad is making us leave. I'm like, why? I was sad. I found it so cool I could talk to a toy. It always sounded busy when I spoke to him. Lots of muffled voices, but always crying in the background. It was like the murmurings of a reception hall with a lot of crying. His response when I asked him why he was leaving us. It's your dad's fault. He's making us go because you are going to heaven and we live in hell. He doesn't like us. So I said, okay, bye. And he was gone. My dad wasn't even there when he left for good, but thinking back, I wonder if he cast out the spirit while we were sleeping. But in that case, how could we say a final goodbye? I eventually forgot all about it, thought nothing of it. My parents didn't get rid of the telephone toy, though, oddly enough. And ever since that day, the phone never worked again. When I finally asked my dad why he made our friend leave, he said because the phone was evil and it wasn't a friend, but a demon trying to get in and guide us away from Jesus. It's funny because I still have dreams thinking back, knowing it was real and how my sisters and dad knew too, but brushed it off so casually gives me the creeps. I still have dreams about it and communicating with him again. When I wake, I'm usually filled with dread. So I know now that when I was little, we were communicating with a demon. I'm a mom now of two teenage kids. And anytime I saw those Fisher Price phones when they were growing up, curiosity got the best of me wanting to purchase one, but ultimately decided it. Thank God, please don't purchase one. <laughs> Not with your track record. I wouldn't dare try and summon a demon again. Although paranormal experiences will never leave me, this one can stay in my memories. I'm glad nothing bad happened and that it didn't go any further and that whatever my dad did at that time to stop it, stopped it finally at that time. However, fast forward years later, I was married and had two boys. I'm 39 now. We had a landline and an answering machine. My husband was also from a religious background, but at the time we were very miserable and on the verge of divorcing. Lots of fights in the house go figure over religion. I was more religious than he was. I wanted to go to church and raise the boys going to church and reading the Bible. He was very much against it. Nothing paranormal happened in our marital home, nothing out of the ordinary. And if so, my husband never would have believed it. Going back to our answering machine, we had a terrible fight one day and both were in separate rooms. The phone rang one night and neither of us bothered to answer it. So the answering machine picked up the call. The next day, there were five missed calls, unknown number. I retrieved the messages and I was shocked. It was a muffled, crying in the background, whispers and voices, exactly like when we would talk to H. Message after message had this. Someone had called and left it just recording until the fifth one. That one, a voice that sounded like an old man or woman, I couldn't tell the gender as it almost sounded like a male and female voice blended together, whispered repeatedly, Laura is fucked. Laura is fucked. Laura is fucked. Sorry for the language. Over and over and over until it ran out. Oh my God. I literally have so many chills. I showed my husband. He had no words. I had a Blackberry at the time, so recorded it and showed my sisters and friends. Everyone confirmed that it indeed was saying Laura is fucked and how creepy. Many just blamed it on a prank caller, but I knew it was the demon from when I was little contacting me again during a really terrible time in my life. But that was it. Nothing else telephone wise has ever happened again. Thank the Lord, excuse me, Laura, where is the recording? Do you have the recording that you've recorded of this? Because you know that we want to hear that. If you have it, please send it in if you have it. I guess the demon was like coming back to try to like get you to flip over to the dark side because you were in a bad spot. Why? I'm assuming you're not living in the same place. So like, why is this demon seems to be attached to you particularly? Oh my God. <laughs> This one is called Bloody Mary, White Mary. I don't know what White Mary is. I've never heard of that. I've only heard of Bloody Mary. 
Hey, Matrix. Hi. Thank you for creating such a wonderful space for people who have lived, seen, or believe in all the in-between. You're so welcome. Thank you for being here. So I wanted to submit my story as this is kind of piggybacking off the submission I saw a few weeks ago. This story is about Bloody Mary slash White Mary. I come from a very big Hispanic family and was very close to aunt and cousins growing up who were always around and actually lived in the same apartment complex as we did. As they were a bit older than me and my sister, they would babysit when my mom and dad would have an occasional date night, which is why my cousin Alma was at our house on the night everything happened. She agreed to babysit me, my brother, and sister for the night. This happened when I was around 10 years old and my cousin is five years older, so she was around 15 years. She was always extremely curious about the unknown and always loved all things kind of scary slash spooky slash witchy. So my parents were heading out and saying their goodbyes. I took advantage of the book I created in the bedroom and went to finish reading a Goosebumps book for school. I was always kind of the black sheep and sister and cousin generally hung out more together than I did. They were in the front of the house in the living room talking and laughing. As I was really into my book, I heard them kind of going back and forth trying to find a mirror. I remember asking why they were looking for a mirror. And that's when my cousin said she wanted to see if she could conjure Bloody Mary's sister. I'm sorry, Bloody Mary has a sister? Has anyone heard of this before? I immediately said, what? You can't mess with her. And so I asked again what she was talking about and saying that Bloody Mary doesn't have a sister. And she responded, yes, she does. I've seen her already. (gasps) Me and my sister looked at each other and looked back at our cousin and all laughed and told her to stop trying to scare us. Alma was a huge practical jokester, always popping out, scaring us or telling us scary stories. So of course we thought that she was messing with us. But then she said, she is the nice one. She is the one who will grant you a wish. I remember laughing and telling both of them they were dumb and went back to reading my book. A typical 10-year-old me response. Fast forward an hour to my sister and cousin finding the mirror my cousin thought would work. Wait, what do you mean thought would work? I figured, I thought that Bloody Mary you could do in like any mirror. Is that not true? Do you need like a certain kind of mirror or something? Fast forward to an hour to my sister and cousin finding the mirror my cousin thought would work and my sister and cousin went into my parents' closet. I have to note this closet was between the living room and master bedroom. It was a long walk-in closet and across from my reading nook. I could hear them faintly talking and whispering for a few minutes and then remember it got really quiet. A few minutes later, my sister started screaming and not a playful scream. She was screaming like she was terrified. But my 10-year-old self thought that they were just playing a joke, so I slowly got up and walked to the closet to open the door. And as soon as my hand touched the doorknob, the closet door flew open. I distinctly remember thinking I didn't touch the doorknob. As the door flew open, my sister bolted past me and ran into my parents' bathroom, and my cousin came running out a little after my sister did. Generally, she's always laughing and saying we're a bunch of scaredy cats, but she looked white as a ghost and visibly shaken. My knee-jerk response was to check on my sister, so I ran into the bathroom, and the second she saw me, she started screaming, saying her chest was burning. I said, what happened? And she started pulling at her shirt and asked me to help her take it off, and that's when I saw it. There was a huge M scratched into her chest. It was blood red and looked almost like it broke the skin. When she saw that, she was inconsolable. So I called for my cousin who was in the living room and as she came into the bathroom, she saw what happened and freaked out. At this point, I was super frustrated that neither of them would tell me what happened. So of course, I threatened to tell my mom and dad everything if one of them didn't say what happened. And that's when my sister started telling me. She said she walked into the closet with my cousin with the mirror and they both had a flashlight. She said my cousin started chanting for White Mary to show herself and come out and play. My sister said the mirror got really blurry and foggy like something was trying to come through or form in the mirror as it was on the floor between them. When this happened, my sister got scared and told my cousin to stop and tried to get up, but that's when she saw the outline of a woman fully appeared. She slowly sat back down, and that's when my cousin started chanting again. My sister said the lady looked older with a black lace veil with black eyes. She said nothing happened for what felt like a few minutes, but then she saw the woman trying to reach out towards my sister. My sister immediately fell back and got up and ran towards the door. She said she thought I was holding the door shut because she was poor pushing on the door and turning the knob and the door wouldn't open and the closet door didn't have a lock on it so there was no way it accidentally locked. When she was at my door, my cousin stayed sitting in front of the mirror and she said it looked like the woman started screaming and thrashing around and the mirror cracked in half and that's when my cousin tried to run for the door too. When I opened the door, I did notice the air feeling cooler, but I didn't think anything about it at the time. 
We spent the rest of the afternoon hanging out and not talking much. We were expected in bed by the time my parents got home, so the next morning I checked on my sister and the M was gone. Neither my sister or cousin brought this up again. Even later in life, they won't talk about it. I still wonder if that's all that happened. First of all, who knew that Bloody Mary had a sister named White Mary? I thought that the cousin said that White Mary was like the nice one and she would grant you wishes and that she has seen her before. Clearly, something went awry that they're not talking about because why, if she was the nice one and the cousin had seen her before, why was there an M scratched into her chest? That is like so terrifying. Oh my God, thank you so much for sharing that creepy story. Has anyone else heard of White Mary? Okay, this one is apparently an abduction story. The person says, this is going to be a short and sweet one, but I'm so curious if other abductees have felt what I have felt. Has anyone felt this? So let's get into this. And if you are an abductee, please let this person know if you have experienced this sensation as well. I'm 100% positive I was an attempted abductee. I was sleeping. I woke up because all of a sudden my bedroom was as bright as if there were no walls, sunlight glaring in, but even brighter, like so bright it was almost like a baby blue iridescent brightness. I woke up in my bed and I felt every inch of my blood, yes, my blood, the blood running through my body was being pulled up like a magnet was pulling the iron that is in my blood to the top of my body. Wow. Remember in the 80s, 90s, that toy that you could put your face into that had all those little tiny metal pieces in. And if you removed your face slow enough, it would leave an impression of what you put in there. Yes, I do know what you're talking about. I literally felt the iron from my blood being pulled up and it felt like what the toy looked like. Laying on my back, I could feel the iron in my blood from the bottom of my body being pulled up with what felt like a magnet. Then I was in this room that was equally as white and I saw shadow figures. They seemed like they were communicating with each other and maybe thought I was still asleep or out of it or whatever, but I was looking around, not able to move much, but didn't necessarily feel like I was clamped down or anything. I think they realized that I was awake or knowing, and I just heard the sound so loud, almost like an MRI or a CT scan sound of the woo, 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 and I woke up. Woke up in my bed, husband next to me, but my body literally felt so heavy, like sand in my bones or blood or whatever, because it was every inch of my body that just felt so heavy. Never had anything before that or after that, but I kind of have always felt like I could have been somewhat susceptible to other realms, stuff, life, spirits, etc. And I think that whoever or whatever took me that night didn't expect me to wake up or be conscious while they were going to be doing something. But that feeling of the iron in my blood being pulled and lifting my body, I can still remember what it feels like and it's scares me to this day. That is a very unique experience. I have not heard any stories of people feeling this when they were getting pulled up. Maybe people just don't talk about that part. Or maybe people are like knocked out or whatever before that feeling happens and you just happen to experience that feeling. But that is a really weird and interesting feeling that you felt. Is there anyone else that has ever had an abduction experience that experienced something like this? Please let us know in the comments. Thank you so much for sharing your story. This one is called Self Exorcism When Finally Dumping Abusive X. Hi, Dematrix. Hi. I've been so in love with your energy and your channel. Yes. Thank you so much for your loving contribution to our world. I'm a hardcore believer in all things glitch, supernatural, extra dimensional, and spiritual. Even as a child, I never bought into the ordinary. I experienced a pretty intense breakup a few years ago that involved some wild events that led me to see that I was in far more danger than I realized while I was in the relationship. I haven't told the story in full like this before, so it may be long. We love long stories. In my early 20s, I had gone through a lot of tough times, including the death of a sibling around generally losing faith in the world. After trying to change the world for the better, but cycling through learning that most do-gooder institutions just covertly pour more money into the problem, I'd become a raging cynic, a jaded social justice person who felt isolated from my friends and family from my perspectives and beliefs. This was the perfect opening for my now ex to swoop in and take advantage of me. We shared a lot of the more radical beliefs, and he was a rare person at the time who actually validated my perspectives. We also shared indulging in conspiracies and our general lack of faith in society and people. Within that was his knowledge on esoteric spiritual things. I quickly learned a lot on my own from there. But I was also being subjected to a ton of emotional manipulation, gaslighting, body shaming, and the whole laundry list of narcissistic partner abuse, but having none of that language or clarity at the time. I also felt put off by his obsessive fixation on evidence of demonic worship by celebrities and politicians. As much as he preached spirituality, most of his energy went towards this. 
Thanks to my own efforts, I found a community of people who were pouring into grassroots efforts that were a healthy, meaningful, and spiritual way to channel that anger and desire for justice. This would ultimately save me and be my grounding force to get me out of a spiritually very dangerous situation. I got deeper with my own healing, spiritual discipline, and practices. First chakra is root, so I started there and focused heavily on safety and protection. Even though I had already begun to smell a lot of the bullshit and feel checked out of the relationship, it would later shock me to find out the person I needed to protect myself from the most is the person I'd allowed to be closest to me. I then rather suddenly developed painful uterine fibroids that made sex impossible. Later, I find out that he'd been sleeping around and that these fibroids saved my life, my womb, and my health. To make a long story shorter, when I learned about him sleeping around, I cut him off, blocked him, and refused to communicate. He showed up at my house more than once, yelling from outside for me to answer the door, and I would ignore him. The last time, I screamed into my pillow from sheer rage, and I swear, thunderstruck. The sky opened up and poured rain on him, forcing him to leave immediately. I remember thinking, I can't go to my favorite meditation and ritual spot at the river now because he'll come find me. I shit you not. I went to the spot with my little sister for the last time the next day, and the tree I always sit under was split in half. No other trees were damaged from the brief storm the day before. That night, I felt this eerie feeling that I was being watched and he might try some spiritual shit on me, so I started to purge as much of his belongings and items related to him from my house as I could. I took the Polaroid of him in my mirror and in my wallet and went to the river to burn them. Right before, I looked at them one last time, and in one, there are literally three women peering over his shoulder looking at the camera, and in the other, there is a shadow with red eyes peering over his shoulder. I shuddered. I literally never noticed this before and quickly burned those bitches. When I came home, I swear I thought I was going to be sick, but what came out was a scream of a voice that wasn't mine and I couldn't catch my breath. It happened several times. I felt so much rage leave my body, but also this icky force I couldn't explain. And then I relived every single lie he'd ever told me in an instant. It felt like that moment in movies when the plot twist is revealed at the end and flashes of past moments quickly go by. Ceiling light was flickering as this was happening too, and for a couple of days after, I had two friends on separate occasions spontaneously vomit while visiting my house, which was so weird. I saged the shit out of my house, played the sound bowl in every room, washed my floors with hot salt water, and sprinkled protection herbs in every corner. When I finally agreed to meet him in person to end things in the most clear way, I protected myself as much as possible energetically. I gripped the wooden figure my closest friend had given me, a Brazilian divine feminine protection amulet. I looked him dead in the eye and I told him I knew every lie he's ever told me and that I know about his demon and that I'm done. And that was and still is the last time I ever spoke to or saw this person. The figure was no longer in my pocket when I got home. I guess when I look back, I'm not sure if he was in cahoots with this entity or if he fed into its presence unknowingly by perpetually indulging in his negativity and narcissism, but I don't really care. I'm just glad I'm the fuck out of that situation. My life is so different now, so much lighter, and I feel like I have myself back again, my intuition. This experience gave me a wholly different perspective on illness and how our spirits communicate with us through the body more so than the mind. They were just waiting for me to get things moving. I've since reunited with my college sweetheart, my soulmate, and being loved on in all the ways I never was and more. So definitely a happy ending for me. The spiritual shit is real, man. Thank you so much for reading my story. This is a crazy one. Did you see those women in the pictures before? I'm going to go with no. I wonder who they were. Like, were those entities? Were those demons? He was like so obsessed, you said, with demonic worship by celebrities and stuff like that. I wonder if he was obsessed with it because he wanted to be in it or he was in it as well. Can we just look up like what a, a figure looks like? Am I even saying that right? It's F-I-G-A, this thing that she's talking about. The figure is a potent symbol from the ancient world. It was worn as a powerful amulet to promote fertility and to protect its wearer from the evil eye, dark and magical forces. Apparently, this is what it looks like. I've actually never seen it before, but I really like it. And 100%, if that thing was gone when you left, it's because it, it did its job and it was done. I fully believe that all the things that we use to protect ourselves, crystals, jewelry, and all those things, when they have done their job or if there's like an attack on them and they've done their job to protect you in that moment or whatever the moment is, they will either break or you will lose them. I'm so glad that you're good now and you're happy. This was a great story. Thank you so much for sharing. 
This one is just titled, I hope you read this. So I have no idea what it's about. So let's dive into it together. Hi, Indie Matrix. Hi. I absolutely love your videos. You are a wonder. Thank you. I would love to share my own stories. You're about to get a lifelong story. So buckle up. Oh, I'm excited. When I was about six years old, my sister and I had our bedroom in the loft of an old farmhouse. As you walk up the stairs at the very top, there is a window on the right side and on the left was a half wall to block off the stairs. My sister's bed was up against that half wall and my bed was across the room about 10 to 15 feet away. We had two different kinds of occurrences in this room. We saw a spaceship right out our window 10 feet away, but I'm a little fuzzy on the details of that, so I'm going to skip that one. I'm certain the next occurrence was an entity of some sort. I woke up in the middle of the night to my sister screaming at me to wake up. When I woke up, she continued screaming for me to turn on the light. The switch was across the room from me right next to her. I did not know what she was screaming about, but I was scared. I got out of my bed and started walking across the room when I was paralyzed by something. I stopped dead in my tracks, frozen in pure fear, completely unable to move anything but my mouth. All I could manage to do was tell my sister I couldn't move. Right in front of me, almost touching me, was a tall black figure. I could not see a face or feet. It floated in front of me. All I could really make out were the hands or fingers. I honestly don't know how to describe this. It looked like it had very long razor-like fingers that floated just as weird as this entity. My mom, hearing the commotion, ran up the stairs and turned on the light. The light switch was underneath the window at the top of the stairs. The second she turned on the light, my body was released and I could move again. Nothing was in front of me anymore. My sister, still in bed, was shaking as she raised her finger and pointed behind my mom. She said, it's right behind you. My mom turned to look and nothing was there. I do not remember seeing anything, but even with the lights on, my sister swears she saw something. Fast forward maybe eight years. My sister moved in with my dad and I stayed with my mom. I love my mom to death. She is now nine years sober, but she was an alcoholic and made my childhood difficult, to say the least. Her addiction was passed off to me in my teenage years. I started with Mary Jane and pills. A couple of years later, I would be using meth and heroin. I believe the addiction could have attracted this entity. I'm around 16 and having a sleepover with two friends. They took the bed and I took the floor. Mind you, this is in a different house. We were sitting in the dark talking while we were trying to fall asleep. All of a sudden, my friend asks me, do you see it? We were all facing the same direction, so I look right in front of us and saw it. All three of us saw it. It was that same shadowy figure I had met as a child. For some reason, I was not as scared this time. I immediately hopped up and turned the lights on and it was gone. A couple of years later, again, in a different house, I woke up in the middle of the night to see this figure floating in the corner of my room. And a couple of years later, again, I saw the same entity, this time in the same house as the previous occurrence. I was still in my teens. I woke up with sleep paralysis. I could not move. I did not see it, but I felt its presence. As this was not the first time it had manipulated me physically, it felt familiar. I have always been very good at blocking out things I did not want to think about, so I chose not to think about it. A couple of years later, I got myself into inpatient treatment. While in treatment, I had a very scary dream. It was about this entity trying to keep me tied to it. It was floating in my room and at the end of my bed. It never spoke and it did not touch me, but I just knew it wanted to be connected to me. I shared this experience with the other ladies in treatment and I think I know what was happening. I do not know if it existed already or if I or my mother manifested this entity with our addiction. A spiritual and insightful woman explained to me addiction is a demon. It feeds off of the depression, misery, hate, and any negativity that is formed during addiction and fuels the spirit. Whether it already existed or we gave it life, I do not know. This lady made a medicine bag and placed it under my mattress. She also wrote something in her native language on the bed as well. I am almost eight years sober and grateful for every moment of my sobriety. I have never again felt or seen this presence in my life. Can we just take one second here and applaud you for being eight years sober? I am so proud of you. That is a hard thing. I have one more story I would like to share. I didn't even think to share this, but I saw another video of yours about similar experiences. This one is very hard to share. I'm about six months into my sobriety and I'm 22 years old. I met my fiance while working at McDonald's. My entire life, I knew what I wanted most out of this life was a family, a child and a husband to call my own. After being together for about six months or a year, I had the strangest nightmare. It felt so real, it messed me up for almost a week. I had a dream that my fiance was murdered. 
It was only the aftermath that I dreamed of. A friend of me came up to me and told me that he was murdered. It felt so real. I screamed. I cried. I grieved. I was so relieved to wake up and find out that it was all a dream. About four years later, we decided to have a baby. I had been on birth control for over a decade, so we expected it to take some time. After the first month of trying, I got scared and decided we weren't ready and I wanted to wait longer. Come to find out a couple weeks later, I was already pregnant. Our little miracle was already growing in my belly. After one month of trying and after being on birth control for a decade, the chances of that are rather low. I knew in my heart, in my soul, this was meant to be. He would be the father of my child and all my children to come. It was always going to be this way. I just knew it in my bones. Fast forward, my beautiful baby girl just turned two. My fiance woke up for work one morning and told me about a nightmare that he had just had. He worked for an internet company and often had to climb very tall rooftops. He told me that in his dream, he fell off a roof while working. He was so frightened by this dream, he did not want to go to work that day. I reminded him no job is worth his life and no one can make him do something he does not want to do. After talking and some good hugs and kisses, he relaxed a little bit and went off to work. Unknown to me, many OSHA regulations were regularly violated by this company. A few days later on Friday, he fell 30 feet at work and passed away in the ambulance. I have always feared this and losing my child more than anything. I lost the love of my life that day, the father of my beautiful baby girl. I was contacted by his co-worker who gave me hope that he would be okay. He said he was conscious, talking, and moving his arms and legs. I did not comprehend how bad it could really be. I filled my head with positive thoughts of me nursing him back to health from whatever injuries he sustained. The whole 45-minute drive to the hospital, I thought no matter what, we would be okay, we would make it work. When I got to the hospital, my sister greeted me. She was already there working, and my mom called to let her know that I might need her. I walked into the family room and saw the chaplain. Immediately, I thought to myself, this must be really bad. I sat waiting to talk to the doctors for maybe 15 minutes while the chaplain made small talk with my sister and I. The doctors finally opened the door to come in. They opened and closed the door two times before finally opening it a third time to walk in, adding to my terror even more. They sat down and I immediately asked what's going on. One doctor started talking and said, well, I don't want to leave you in suspense. Kenneth died, <gasps> giving me an ounce of hope before telling me there was none. They continued talking, but I don't remember what they said. I looked at my sister with a look she could only describe as stupefied. I remember looking at her. I remember saying, no, 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 and then dropping to the floor to cry. She said the scream I let out will never leave her memory, but I don't remember making a sound. I thought to myself, doctors are idiots and liars, and I snapped out of it, and I told them to take me to him immediately. They walked me into the room right across from where I was. My baby was right there, dead, and I didn't know it. When I walked in and I saw him, I lost it again, and I cried, and I said, this is where my babies come from. I don't know if you can understand the pain of knowing your entire future and the future of your children was completely rewritten without your consent. All the stability I had only known with him was gone. The next week was a complete fog. I'm so proud of myself as a mother. My baby didn't lose me for a second, even though I'd lost myself. Anytime I cried, I would try to walk away, but sometimes I would let her see me. I still say, I'm sorry, baby. Mama has the sads right now, but it's okay to be sad, and I will feel better soon. Mama just misses daddy. She usually gives me hugs and tries to comfort me. There is not a word for what a wonder my little girl is, my angel. I am so sorry for your loss. This one got me. I had to stop. A few days after his death, I had a dream, the biggest mindfuck of my life. In my dream, I woke up in bed next to my love from this dream. My real life was the dream or the nightmare. I cried and I cried and I held him and I told him about this dream. He held me tight. He kissed me and he told me, it's okay, baby. It's just a dream. I'm right here. Waking up from that dream felt like he died all over again. He has only visited my dreams a couple of times since then. I think he knew it only made it harder, and no matter what I want, I have no choice but to move on. The world keeps spinning even when your world stops. It's been a little over five months since he left us. It's just me and my little girl now. Thank you for being you and giving so many people a safe place to share their life stories. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Since his death, I have learned some things. There is indeed a great awakening happening in the world right now. I believe that we choose our lives and the trials that we face. I believe the answers are all within us, but we all have different lessons to learn at different times in our lives. We all have a road to walk. Some of it is destined and some of it we choose. I used to be scared of dying and what may come next, but now my love is there waiting for me. 
It kills me that I was not able to help him on his journey beyond, but I know that he will be there to help me. I always had beliefs, but now I pray every day. I am so grateful for everything in my life. I am a very, very lucky woman. I have known great love. I have overcome struggles that some could not. I have the most kind and beautiful girl I could have ever dreamed of. I'm sorry for the long letter, but thank you for the safe space. The difference between these stories was like astronomical. The first story was a creepy, scary story about like a demon and addiction. And then the second story just hit me out of nowhere. I was not prepared for it. This one is called I Summoned a Ghost. Hi, Andy Matrix. Hi. I've been wanting to share this story for a while, but I'm not very articulate with my words, so I guess I'll try my best. This was a few years ago, so I may miss some details, but here we go. Around two years ago, I and an old friend had a sleepover. She suggested playing with a Ouija board, and we had some protective candles from a witch store that she had gone to. So we collected our items, I got in my car, and we drove to a cemetery. We're go Not only are we playing with the Ouija board, but we're going and playing with it at a cemetery. Really, people. Initially, we ended up at an indigenous burial ground, but I was extremely scared because it was night and we were nowhere near the road so i decided to find a cemetery closer to civilization good idea i guess we ended up at a 200 year old cemetery in amherstburg ontario which they say is one of the most haunted cities in the world just the two of us by grover washington was playing in the car when we got out it's the two of us you and i who else thinks of austin powers with mini me you and i just the two of us Back to the story, back to the story. We took out the Ouija board and the candles and lit them right on top of a flat memorial tombstone, which is very disrespectful. Looking back at this, do not do this. We opened the Ouija board as you would, spoke to it and asked if any spirits wanted to come through and we were being very respectful, letting them know we just wanted some insight and we weren't there to cause any trouble. For a few moments, nothing happened. I was singing just the two of us because the song had been on in the car and I asked spirit if they liked the song and slowly the planchette moved to no. My friend and I looked at each other and I think we both thought that each other moved it. While we were staring at each other in shock, the planchette kept circling no more forcefully, coming off the word and immediately jumping back onto the no as if the spirit was upset. I quickly asked if we could sing them a different song or if they'd like us to do something else so they weren't upset. The planchette quickly moved to yes. I asked what we could do and the planchette moved to the R, then U, and I was honestly confused, wondering what could come next. And before I could even guess, the planchette moved to N. For a split second, we waited expecting more, but then we realized it said run. Without saying goodbye, we closed up the Ouija board, blew out the candles, got over the cemetery fence and ran into the car. Big mistake. You need to say goodbye and close out the board, friends. In the car, we were freaking out, asking each other if we moved the planchette. We both realized that it was neither of us. We ended up finding some random bench, put the Ouija board on the bench and left it there. We wanted nothing to do with it. And when we went back in the morning, it was gone. Now weird things started happening. My car radio would glitch. My car had never done this before. The music would stop working completely with no possible way to get it back on. Then miraculously, 20 minutes into your drive, just the two of us would start playing. After the first time, this becoming more frequently happening twice a day for about three weeks before the next weird thing started happening. I knew once just the two of us had started playing, it wasn't a car issue. It was getting very frustrating and one day the music completely cut out and was making very weird static sounds, almost like a warped voice. I decided to open the sunroof and I started screaming. I said, I'm giving you five seconds to leave me the fuck alone or I'm going to lose it. And then I counted down from five and my music started playing once I hit one. Eventually, I started having tire issues. One of my tires almost completely fell off. Then it wouldn't start for no reason. We jumped the car four times and it has gas in it and it just wouldn't start. Then it just miraculously started working. After we finally got the car to work again, my tire exploded on the highway. I cannot find the photo, unfortunately, but it looks like a demon poked its nail into it and just slid it down the tire with its nail. Oh my God. So this is about three months after the initial Ouija board interaction and I was effed up. Too many expensive fixes for this haunted car. My friend mentioned that she grew up next to a psychic and she suggested we go to see her. She hadn't seen her in many years, though. I didn't want to show up at this woman's house uninvited, so I told my friend that if we drive by the house and we see her outside, then we can go and talk to her. But if not, then we'll just continue about our day. We drove past the house and what do you know? She was sitting on the porch. We pulled up to the house and she was ecstatic to see my friend and I honestly think that she was out there for a reason. She invited us in and we explained to her the whole story. 
She's pretty disappointed. She said, never open up a Ouija board and we should have known better. She said immediately she could feel the spirit and now she could see him hovering on top of me. She described him as a tall young man from the 1800s wearing khaki pants and a white dress shirt that had big puffy shoulder pads. She said he's not harmful. It seems like he's more here messing around with us, just trying to bug us and be a teenage boy. But she also said spirits can become harmful, which girl, he was harming my car. She gave us sage, stems, and some salt to keep in the car for cleansing and she said that she was going to help him ascend into the light rather than in this halfway zone. A few days went by with no issues, and then a few weeks went by, and then a month with no activity. We ended up speaking with her again, and she informed me that that night she had used everything in her to try to get him to ascend, and he just wouldn't do it. She reiterated that he was just messing around and going halfway there and then looking back and smiling at her, and then not going the rest of the way just to bug her and mess with her. He's a cheeky ghost, I guess. (laughs) Haha. She ended up calling her other friend, who is a psychic, and they both decided to tried together at the same time to get them to ascend, and he continued to just mess with them. They both agreed that the next morning they were going to try to have them ascend while they were physically trying together, thinking it was probably stronger than if they were over the phone. He was giving them a hard time. Turns out in the morning she woke up and felt and realized that he had ascended by himself, and she reached over for her phone and her friend had already texted her. He went by himself. Thank you so much for reading. I am so glad that at least this entity that attached himself to you was not a bad one, was just an annoying teenage boy spirit. But I hope we learned our lesson. At least close out the damn Ouija board if you're going to open it. That was such a good story, though. Thank you so much for sharing. This one is called Silly But Strange Glitches That Saved Us Money. I wonder what these are going to be. Let's see. Hey, Auntie. Hi. I love watching your videos on YouTube, and I love hearing everyone's stories and knowing that people with strange experiences have a safe place to go with you. Yes, you do. We believe you. I've had a lot of experiences in my life from paranormal to just plain strange, and I'm generally a inquisitive person, so I'm always searching for answers. Listening to yours and others' experiences is nice since it means that I'm not alone with the strangeness. The reason I'm writing today is because some silly, strange things that have been happening within my house lately, and I truly cannot find an explanation. We will call them glitches in the matrix, but here goes. The other day is the most recent, so I guess I'll start there. I had a collection of loose Ziploc bags that were just left over from other boxes, and I put them in a little container for storage specifically used for loose Ziploc bags. I was reorganizing the kitchen one day and very distinctly remember putting the baggies in that container. The next day, when I needed one of those said baggies, all of them were gone. I looked everywhere and asked my husband, it's just me and him at home, but he swore he did not move them. Since I had just reorganized the night before, we hadn't done much in there since, so it made no sense on why they were moved. The container was there, but it was empty. The bags appeared to have grown legs and just walked away. It was strange, but not worth worrying about. Regardless, I bought more, one box to be specific, and I didn't think much of it. A few days later, we planned to go grocery shopping, and I was making a shopping list while checking contents to restock. When I looked at the Ziploc baggies, knowing I would have to order some, they were all there again. All the loose ones and even box I bought forever ago, and by the way, was not there when I reorganized. I asked my husband and he was just as dumbfounded as me. He has a tendency to brush those things off, but I still just want to know how my Ziploc baggie's vacation was. (laughs) There was also a time when we gained an extra jar of Nutella. Backstory. We buy the pack from Sam's Club, and they are huge containers you get in a two-pack, plus they're only $9. They're only $9 for two huge things of Nutella. I need to go there. They last us forever, but eventually we went through one, and my husband and I both remember making a joke about making the container into chocolate slash Nutella milk by mixing milk in the empty container, but we didn't, and we threw it away. Slowly, we went through the other one, and when it was getting low, my husband made a comment that we would need more. Again, as we were making a shopping list, my husband pulled out the old jar and then proceeded to pull out another jar of Nutella. Strangely, this one was brand new and still had the seal on it. There was no way we had three jars. And like I said, the jars are huge and I only buy them from Sam's Club in a two pack. So there's no way we had an extra jar without realizing it. We both were very confused, but just shrugged it off. It was weird, but I guess we saved money that day. However, I hope the alternate reality versions of us are okay without their Nutella. This one is the silliest, not gonna lie. My husband and I live in a duplex with two bedrooms. I use the additional room as a craft room as I run a small business selling homemade crafts. The closet in the craft room has an ability that neither myself nor my husband are able to explain, and it's kind of silly, so be prepared. We call it the Geek Squad closet because we have put outdated or broken electronics in there and come back later to find that they work like new. For example, we had a laptop that died and nothing we did could fix it. We tried everything, and my husband loves fixing electronics and stuff like that, but he could not figure it out. We decided to put it in the closet for storage to deal with it later. 
My husband decided randomly to putter around with it again, and when he opened the laptop and turned it on, please tell me why it worked like he just took it out of the box. The same thing happened with two different tablets. Both would not turn on or keep a charge, so we were going to dispose of them later, but after a short stay in the magic closet, they were revived. We ended up keeping both tablets and the laptop since they work just fine now. We thought it was a fluke the first couple of times, but now we put stuff in there when we don't want to deal with it, and it always just comes back out working. There's simply no other explanation other than the Geek Squad closet is magic. I'm a 90s baby, so I'm sort of up to date with technology, but I'm not that good with it. Question, I guess, has anyone else left something like a computer, phone, tablet alone for months and then it fixed itself? I figured it would be the opposite, but I have been wrong a time or two. Personally, that has never happened to me. I have things that don't work and they still don't work. So I'm gonna say you have a magic closet. There are countless times I've been actively looking for something and the item will just randomly reappear where I was just looking or it will come out of thin air right in front of my eyes. Once I tore my house apart looking for something and when I blinked and reopened my eyes, it literally appeared as if it fell from the ceiling. I could still see it falling when it landed. That one freaked me out a little, and I ended up watching Disney movies all night until my husband got home. They say don't look a gift horse in the mouth, and while I do appreciate the money saving these mentioned glitches have given us, not all experiences have been so innocent like these. There are so many stories similar, but I feel like I've gone on for too long. You never have gone on for too long. Always just keep going. I haven't even mentioned my numerous paranormal experiences or how my, call it, third eye or gut feeling has saved my life multiple times. I'd love to share those with you as well, but I'll save it for next time. For now, I'll dip my toes in with these silly strange ones thank you for reading and thank you for being you thank you for being you and thank you so much for sharing these stories i absolutely loved these this one is called Generational Haunting. Hi, Indie Matrix. Hi. I found your page a few months ago and I love hearing all the stories. I thought my experiences growing up were strange, but now I know it's pretty common and it's comforting in a weird way. This is a long one. When I was three, my family moved into a new build house, so no previous history. It was a small three bedroom, 1,500 square feet, so not a huge house, but I had my own room and my little sister's room and parents' room were very close by. I suffered from night terrors as soon as we moved in. I would see creatures with red eyes trying to crawl in the windows, suffer sleep paralysis, which I didn't have the words to explain to my parents, and hear things like wet footsteps on the hardwood floor. When I was five, my parents told me to brush my teeth and go to bed. The whole bathroom and my bedroom door were about five feet from the living room where they were watching TV so they could see me the whole time. When I walked across the hall from the bathroom to my bedroom, my room stayed dark after I flipped the light switch, so I looked over and told my parents. They walked over and that's when small pieces of light like glitter began falling from the ceiling and disappearing into the floor. My mom thought we were going crazy. She reached out to touch it and it disappeared through her palm and came out the other side. It got brighter and the glitter light got bigger and bigger and then slowly faded away. The craziest part was me and my mom could see it, but my dad couldn't. We were both freaking out and he was freaking out because he didn't know what we were talking about. He only saw a dark room. I'm glad that your mom could see it because I was assuming you were going to say that she was like, there's nothing there. What's going on? We closed that door and I shared my little sister's room for years until my brother was born. We closed the door and didn't enter a whole bedroom in a tiny house for two and a half years. When my brother was born, they reopened the room and moved me back in because nothing else weird had happened and we needed this space. I suffered from nightmares and sleep paralysis as soon as I moved back in and slept with the lights on and my door open for years. Fast forward to my teenage years and I had an addition younger sister, so now four kids total. My next younger sister and I shared the haunted room. My nightmares became kind of a joke between us because we had bunk beds and every night I would thrash and scream and my little sister would kick the bottom of my bunk until I woke up enough to stop. So every day I'd ask how many times she had to kick the bunk. I rarely remembered my dreams, but I knew that they did get violent. I once broke a tooth and would regularly wake up bruised from hitting the walls with my body. Oh my God. Oh, you mean you broke a tooth from like thrashing around? My family decided to move when I was 17 and when we were getting the house ready, things really ramped up. My nightmares increased and my sister and I would wake up to the sounds of shattering glass. Since we were moving and the house was staged for realtors, it wasn't like it was something falling off the bed and breaking. We would wake up and look for anything that could have broken because we needed to make sure the room was perfect for people looking at the house. We never found anything. Over time, it got louder and louder until one night we were sure the entire window in our room was shattered. It hadn't, and we slept with the light on the rest of the night, and we were 14 and 17. It culminated one night right after the house sold. 
I was having a nightmare and my sister kicked the bunk until I woke up. She started asking me when I climbed down and I was super groggy saying, what, you just woke me up, I'm still in bed. She started panicking, asking me to stop joking around and why was I standing in front of her, not moving? It's worth noting that we had a street light right outside our bedroom window, so our room was never really dark. We had mini blinds, but no blackout curtains, so there was fairly bright orange glow in our room all the time. I realized something bad was happening and I told her, listen to my voice and where it's coming from. I'm still above you in bed. She started screaming and shoved herself against the wall. I felt the bunk bed shake when she did this and could hear her right below me. She was shrieking that there was a shadow person that was standing over her, which she assumed was me. I tried to talk her through reaching out to turn on her lamp, but the shadow person was still there and she wouldn't move. So I had to climb down and turn on the light. It was the scariest freaking thing I've ever experienced. I cannot explain how badly I did not want to climb down and deal with it. But when my poor little sister was terrified, I turned on the overhead light, avoiding her bedside lamp and there was nothing there. We slept with the full overhead light on the last few nights until we moved. We had assumed it was our old house that was haunted, so we weren't worried when we moved. It was a much bigger house and we all had our own rooms. It was a huge entrance with double doors. Pretty soon after we moved in, we would all be woken up in the middle of the night by something slamming into the front doors. We dismissed it over and over that maybe it was just kids playing pranks on the new neighbors until one night it sounded like a giant boulder was smashed against the doors. It was so loud. It shook the entire house and everyone rushed out of our bedrooms in the middle of the night. We turned on all the lights, checked for damage, looked for the rock, but there was nothing. A few weeks later, every photo frame flipped face down like dominoes and then nothing happened again. Fast forward again to now. I have two daughters who sleep in bunk beds in my husband's childhood home. We lived here for years with no experiences, but my older daughter started having night terrors and weird experiences that she would have a hard time explaining. I started seeing shadows moving out of the corner of my eye and several experiences of being touched. One time my right arm was lifted and dropped. Another time I thought my husband was rubbing my back, but when I rolled over, no one was there. So they weren't scary experiences for me, but still not very normal. How were those not scary for you? The final straw was my older daughter having a panic attack, screaming that there was something in her room. I immediately did research on someone to do a spiritual cleansing in our home. Since then, things have been calm. My daughter slept through the night for the first time in her life at seven years old. She's now eight and she's doing so much better. My personal opinion is that we had a generational poltergeist or bad energy following my family. I still feel like it's not all the way gone. I see glimpses sometimes, but I try my best to channel healing white light from spirit and do protective meditations. At this point in my life, I accept the spirit world as fact, but I draw the line at things bothering my kids. I plan to explain things when they get older and more curious, but I never want them to be as scared as I was when I was a kid. I wonder if it is like a generational haunting and something's attached to your family or if it's something that's attached to you in particular or if it's attached to something. Like, is there something that you took with you from the first house to the second house to where you live now? Like, is something that you've had at all these places that you've experienced these things? I'm wondering if it's attached to something. But I'm glad that you got the house cleansed and everything is good right now. And thank you so much for sending your story. That concludes our creepy compilation for today, but if you want to keep it going now, you can check out this video or this playlist.